again. Uh, today's the last of the simulation lectures we'll do, and we'll talk about partial differential equations and also mm -hmm. Gaussian process inference. Uh, again, surprise, surprise. Um, so first of all, a bit of an outlook of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, I'll clarify what a PDE actually is and why these equations are important, why, what, what, the, what all the fuss is about, essentially. Um, and the main part of the lecture will be uh, showing you how to integrate uh, PDE-based models into machine learning models, and specifically probabilistic machine learning models. Um, and we'll do all that by sort of working through a practical modeling example, just to make things a little more visual. So first of all, PDEs are used as the language of, of mechanistic knowledge. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, a me mechanistic model, it has the term mechanism in it. It, it describes um, essentially um, what's going on, for example, in the real world, um, but also in financial markets and situations like that, by describing the mechanism that generated the data. Um, and think about something like uh, opposite charges attract, equal charges repel, right? You don't know how two protons, like do, you don't directly know how two protons will interact, for example, but you know that they will sort of repel and you know the strength of that force. And this is what I mean by mechanism. You don't know the trajectories of the protons, but you know how to get to the trajectories from that mechanistic knowledge. Another example of a physical system that is actually described by a P PDE is the, uh, the realm of fluid mechanics. Um, so the description of fluids of all sorts. Uh, and actually, there's sort of a fluid in a, in, a, in a wider sense. So for example, climate models and um, weather models are also uh, based on these, these uh, PDEs. And the, the important model here, it's actually a very important system of, of PDEs. It's called the Navier-Stokes equations. You might have heard that um, already. And yeah, they're described to simulate systems like the weather, uh, climate, but also oceans. So you could do like a a tsunami model which predicts when a tsunami will hit the coast or whether it will actually uh, come about. Um, because of, well, you can sort of see from these situations that the models are typically really large scale. So simulating the ocean, simulating the entire Earth's climate is over a long period of time and it's a, it's a really large system. Um, so yeah, the, these problems we're talking about are typically of very, very large scale and they're also very difficult to solve uh, in practice. Um, but also, PDEs are kind of an interesting thing to talk about because the theory and practice uh, of PDEs are, are actually still a highly active uh, field of research after, you could argue, already a century or maybe even centuries of research going into this, this field of mathematics or applied mathematics. Um, and it's actually, in a sense, so difficult that one of the well-known millennium problems is about these Navier-Stokes equations, namely, just to state whether the set of equations ha even has a solution and how smooth that solution is. So that sort of maybe already gives you an insight into how difficult it is sometimes to talk about these, these models. Now because it's, uh, these are typically difficult, and this is sort of, I guess, a common scheme in mathematics, uh, nonlinear or general PDEs um, are quite difficult to understand. Um, and so in this lecture, we'll sort of restrict ourselves a little bit to a simpler class, namely the class of linear PDEs. I'll define what that is in a little bit. Um, but just know that even if we restrict ourselves to that class, this is actually still quite a powerful uh, modeling language. So for example, many of the physical processes that happen around us are or can be described via linear PDEs still quite uh, accurately. So for example, thermal conduction the diffusion of heat in, for example, a piece of metal is described by the so-called heat equation, which is one of these linear PDEs. Um, the phenomenon of electromagnetism, I already talked about protons interacting. This is also described by a set, actually a system of linear PDEs called the Maxwell equation or Maxwell's equations. Um, wave mechanics, so essentially the description of, of uh, water waves and, and uh, waves that sort of propagate through air can be described to a very good approximation by the wave equation, it's also a linear equation, um, and the particle velocities of uh, particles in Brownian motion are also described by the so-called Fokker-Planck or Kolmogorov forward equation. The latter one actually also has quite an important uh, 
place in mathematical statistics where it uh, relates to stochastic processes. But there's not just physical models that uh, are described by these equations, but I already hinted at uh, financial markets, so the, the famous Black-Scholes equation, um, which is used in mathematical finance, is also such an equation. And finally, um, if we actually, in practice, work with uh, nonlinear partial differential equations, we can use linear approximations to these nonlinear equations um, in numerical sim uh, simulation, essentially by iteratively relinearizing. So with all that motivation aside, we use these models typically um, to describe the, uh, the, the behavior of a real world um, system. And we don't know the exact behavior of that system in advance, but we know, as I said, how, it, how the mechanism behind the, uh, the, the system works. So I'm deliberately phrasing um, this this goal we have for this lecture here um, as a sort of pseudo-graphical model because we want to fuse um, the well-known or the, 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 the models we know, the probabilistic models with these mechanistic models, with this mechanistic knowledge um, in order to gain some of the strengths of machine learning in practice. And this is also sometimes called, uh, called hybrid modeling because we have empirical knowledge from data, from observational data, and then we have uh, mechanistic knowledge which uh, ties all that nicely, uh, together quite nicely. Um, and so we know, which is why this is shaded, we know the, me uh, the, the mechanism and we want to infer the system behavior. However, PDEs and, um, yeah, well, P PDEs usually have some, some sort of, a, or have some sort of set of parameters and we usually don't know these parameters in advance. I give a couple of examples here. So examples of these, um, Parameters are like strengths and distributions of heat sources or charges in electrical problems. Um, material parameters such as the speed at which heat diffuses through a certain material or actually just forces in, in classical mechanics are all examples of this. And we don't usually know these, but we can measure them. These measurements are typically noisy, but from that we can already see that we actually need to be able to deal with observation noise in our models. And Classical descriptions of these things typically don't handle that too well. So we have these uh, measurements of the system parameters, uh, and the system parameters also sort of need to be known in order to, to uh, solve for the system behavior, right? Because they, the, the equation is sort of governed by these, these parameters. Um, and sometimes we also have measurements of the system itself in terms, uh, think about like a sort of a heat simulation of the, of the heat distribution, we, we, we might just place a thermometer at a certain point in our simulation and measure the temperature of a piece of metal, for example. But we can't do that at every point of the simulation. And this is why we actually need that mechanistic knowledge to sort of interpolate between our measurements. Question? Where do we get the measurements for the system? That depends on the, on the situation. Um, ch forces you can just measure, right? There's like essentially measurement devices for that, for example. Um, sometimes it's actually more, more difficult to, to um, measure this stuff, in which case you can actually use these measurements and sort of propagate the knowledge back to the system parameters, which is then called an inverse problem. And Natane already talked to, to this, uh, about this quite a lot in the ODE lecture. So, you can, so this is actually uh, sort of the, 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 the flip side of what we're doing here, right? Not, not necessarily just simulating what the system does, but also inferring what the what the sort of causal mechanism underlying that uh, is, yeah. Um, and our approach to this here, and actually sort of the goal of this lecture is to use Bayesian statistical estimation to fuse what we know, like the mechanism that we know, and um, this measurement data, and actually also uncertainties that are probably contained in most of the, these system parameters. Why Bayesian statistical estimation? Well, because we have all these uncertainties here, and it would actually be quite a, quite a good thing to propagate all, essentially all that we don't know onto the solution so that we can give some, some, some uh, confidence uh, to the predictions we do. All right, so let's actually jump into the, the PDE world and first of all answer the question what we actually mean by a linear PDE. Um, so first of all, Think about, uh, we, we want to simulate a, a physical system. Typically, physical systems have some sort of spatial extent. 
And if, they, if it's a system that evolves over time, we also have a time span over which we want to simulate this. So first of all, we, we define this, this uh, set D, um, which is called the domain. And then we look for a function that describes the, a physical system, say for example, a temperature distribution, or like a, a, the forces generated by, by, a, by a set of electrical charges. And this is actually the unknown function u. This is the, the description of the system that we wanna, wanna simulate. The mechanistic knowledge in these PDE-based models is actually given by this equation here, where d is a so-called linear differential operator. I'll actually show you some examples of that. But generally speaking, this is just a linear combination of partial derivatives of the unknown function u. And we don't know the function u, but we prescribe a fixed value f, which is called the right-hand side of the equation, for this linear combination. And this is essentially turns out to be a very elegant description of a lot of physical processes, for example. Now, some examples of linear differential operators are given by the probably the uh, most well-known one is the Laplacian, which is just uh, the sum over all second partial derivatives, essentially the, the trace of the Hessian, right? The um, um, sort of non-mixed partial derivatives. Um, and another example of a PDE is actually an F or a linear PDE is actually an affine ODE. So in, in, in case where we only have one input variable instead of the input variables to our function, um, we can construct this differential operator here, which consists of just the, the one derivative that we can actually, actually build with this function and another uh, sort of linear term here. And then this, if you rearrange terms in the equation, just gives you the vector field um, of an affine ODE. So in, in a sense, affine ODEs or Affine ODEs are spe special case of uh, linear PDEs, and in general, an, an ODE is a special case of a PDE. It's not always helpful to think a bit about it this way because the PDEs are, tend to be a little bit more difficult to simulate, but it's just sort of a closure uh, argument here. Now let's talk about some problems we have with these uh, equations if we want to actually apply them in practice. First of all, usually we do not get an analytic solution. This was already true for uh, a lot of the ODEs we considered, um, but here it's, in a sense, because it's a wider class of models, it's actually, uh, uh, we, well, we inherit these problems. Um, so we need to use numerical solvers to actually get to these unknown functions u, which, because the function u is actually an infinite dimensional object, will introduce discretization error inherently, unless you know something about the problem, but yeah, we're gonna talk about this. Secondly, we already sort of talked about this. Um, the PDE has parameters, and we can actually pinpoint what these are now a little bit better. The, the right-hand side function f is one of these parameters. In a lot, like for example, when I said, well, heat sources, we need to know heat sources that are involved in our problem, and charges, these are typically uh, described by the right-hand side of the equation. And material parameters, for example, are the coefficients in the, in the linear combination of the, uh, partial derivatives of the function u. And we don't know these exactly usually. Um, I already s uh, talked about this. Now finally, um, classical solvers that have been developed essentially over the past uh, century are sometimes quite difficult to embed in computational pipelines because of, of this reason that, well, the parameters are usually not known exactly, but we sort of need one estimate, we need a point estimate of a parameter, and so it's, it t tends to be quite difficult to actually propagate these uncertainties through the solvers, which is something that we aim at solving by this Bayesian um, approach we take here. Now, there's a bit of a problem here, because PDEs, just the PDE itself, usually does not uh, identify its solution uniquely. Um, for ODEs, we have already seen that we also need to formulate initial value problems, um, because essentially there's a constant of integration involved if we solve these equations. Um, and for PDEs, this is uh, not much different, but the types of additional conditions we need to impose are a little bit more difficult than in the, in the, the ODE case. But let's actually look at an example first. So we look at the so-called Poisson equation, which is just the Laplacian of the function having a prescribed, uh, prescribed value. And let's, for now, Think of a solution candidate to this, uh, this function, uh, this, sorry, this equation, which is just linear. And we can see that if we apply the Laplacian to this linear function, I said this is just a trace of the Hessian matrix, 
because this is a linear function, the Hessian is zero. It doesn't have a second order term. So this is just zero, which means that linear functions are actually in the kernel of uh, this, this differential operator. And so for any solution of the Poisson equation, we can just add a linear term and still get a solution. Because, and I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit, this, this differential operator is actually linear. Um, so usually, maybe also in the spirit of what you do in the ODE case, uniqueness, uh, uniqueness can be achieved by requiring an additional condition to hold, which is usually a, a boundary condition, or in this case, actually, to keep everything linear, a, bo a linear boundary condition, where again, we have a linear operator here. i talk about this in more detail in a little bit. Um, but in the physical intuition, why we prescribe something that happens at the boundary of our simulation domain, domain is actually that, well, if you think about the, the problem you're simulating, there might be interactions uh, coming into your system from the outside of the simulation domain. And if you don't simulate these outside influences, so if you essentially don't model them in your mathematical framework, then essentially anything can happen. Like, if you, if you model a piece of the, the heat distribution, a piece of metal, and there's like a truck rushing into it, then yeah, what, what's gonna happen? You don't know. So you essentially need to model um, everything that happens outside of the simulation domain um, by summarizing it to how the outside interacts with your, with your simulation at the boundary, because that's the only sort of influence you can actually, can actually have here. Um, and a PDE together with a set of boundary conditions is uh, usually referred to as a boundary value problem. Now an example of, a specific example of such boundary conditions are Dirichlet boundary conditions, which just say essentially, well, we, we the, so the operator restricts the function to the boundary, which just says, well, we, 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 we prescribe the value of the function at the boundary. Uh, if you think about like the function u being a heat distribution in some piece of uh, material, then this just says, well, we know what the temperature is at the boundary. And this, in, in physical analogy, just, this might just be like, you have a huge bucket of ice water, which will not change temperature, whatever happens uh, on the inside of the domain. So you know it, the, the, the boundaries of your domain will, will always stay at zero, essentially. All right, so I already sort of revolved around this point for quite a bit, but PDEs are actually statements about functions. So we have an unknown function, u. Um, and functions are typically uh, infinite dimensional objects. So you might already know if there's an infinity involved, you need to be a little bit careful. Um, but it turns out that we have quite um, a, co a convenient structure for functions because it turns out that functions or function spaces, sets of functions, uh, under certain conditions are actually vector spaces, right? So um, you, uh, from, from sort of linear algebra classes, you might be very familiar with the vector space Rn, so essentially the uh, space of n-dimensional column vectors. And you, as you know, you can add them, you can multiply them with a scalar, and you can do essentially the same thing with functions just by saying, well, the, the, the sum of two functions and the product of a function with a scalar are just defined pointwise. This is what's said here. So we have vector space structure, but that also comes with all the um, sort of nice amenities that, that come with um, vector spaces, so there can be bases in these vector spaces, right? It's just, a, it's just a linear combination of some set of basis vectors, and for function spaces, you have a linear combination of a set of basis functions. Usually, these, uh, for, at least for the function spaces we care about here, these bases are actually infinite dimensional, and sometimes it, they don't even exist in this form. This is what I mean by you have to be careful, but for, for this lecture, these, these exist, they are infinite dimensional, and they exist as essentially a series of, of vectors. You also have linear maps, and we know from finite dimensional vector spaces, we can repre represent linear maps by matrices. And the linearity property just means we can pull the matrix inside a sum, and we can pull scalars out of the, out of the matrix vector product, essentially. Linear maps in infinite dimensional vector spaces, specifically in function spaces, are, are called linear operators. And this is also actually what, where the term linear differential operator comes from, because the, a differential operator maps a function, for example, to its derivative. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a map between vector spaces of functions, and it has this linearity property. So essentially because you have the sum rule of differentiation, and you can pull scalars out of um, a derivative. So, this is actually why we talk about linear equations and linear 
differential operators. And by sort of applying this knowledge, you can see that a linear PDE is nothing but a linear system in an infinite dimensional vector space. So we will actually, in this lecture, apply quite a bit of intuition from solving linear systems that we developed with Jonathan's lectures to the case of PDEs. This is actually quite a nice uh, analogy you can always think about when working with these systems. There's uh, two more details. Well, you can define norms on vector spaces, right? For example, here we have the maximum norm or the infinity norm on, on Rn. And um, well, the, the, essentially the, uh, the analog of this also exists for certain classes of functions. So you can just take the supremum over a function. And then that, is, that it turns out to be a norm on some function spaces. Um, if we have norms, we can also talk about convergence. And if every, every sequence in these spaces converges, we can talk about a Banach space. And then, well, we know that Rn with the infinity norm is a Banach space, but actually the space of k times continuously differ differentiable functions on some set uh, is actually also a Banach space with this particular um, norm. And so we, again, we can take a lot of the intuition uh, from the finite dimen dimensional case over to the infinite dimensional case, but maybe not always. So we have to be careful in these, in these uh, senses again. And the same actually also holds for, for inner products and Hilbert spaces with, with a couple of caveats, which I'm actually not going to go into right now. Uh, just notice that usually sort of these translations involve uh, replacing indexes into column vectors by function evaluations and then sums by integrals sort of a very straightforward way of, of, of uh, deriving these analogs here. Yeah, all right. So let's move on to a bit, a bit more practical topic, which is actually this toy example that will uh, serve as the main uh, motivational example uh, with which I'm gonna introduce the methods uh, we're gonna use here, which is uh, a simple model of the heat distribution in a central processing unit in a computer, a CPU. Um, now, this is what the discrete uh, GPU in a computer usually looks like. Actually, this, this metal piece on top here is not the, 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 the sort of the chip itself. It's just a cover, which is uh, used to extract heat from the chip. Uh, actual silicon is just this little black box here. This black, uh, well, chip, actually. Um, and these components are particularly um, limited by the heat they give off, right? If, if there's currents going through it due, due to internal resistances and things like that, the chip, will, uh, the chip will produce quite a lot of heat. And if these systems overheat, they may take damage uh, or not function properly. And we want to avoid that. So it's actually quite a good thing to know what the, what the temperature distribution in your chip uh, is in practice. Um, you might already sort of guess that this thing is actually really thin. Um, and so it's, it's, we, we can sort of model it as a two-dimensional thing. So we, uh, for now, we'll actually restrict ourselves to a two-dimensional uh, modeling and like a mathematical modeling of this system. Uh, the, this is the, the spatial domain we talk about. So it's just a, a Cartesian product of, of intervals in this case, the length and the width of the chip. Um, but actually, since there's some um, homogeneous geometry here, um, to keep things simple for this lecture, we'll even restrict ourselves to just this modeling the, the temperature distribution um, sort of on this line slicing through the chip right here. Um, we, we are actually gonna see a two-dimensional example a little, uh, towards the end of the lecture, and we'll see that this is actually quite a good model assumption for this particular case. But now let's turn to um, actually moving from a um, sort of physical model into math, right? So first of all, we already defined the spatial domain that we're gonna work on, which is just this interval from zero to the length of the CPU, which is sort of this coordinate axis right here. Um, now we know that when we wanna simulate um, problems involving heat, we, we actually need to know where the heat comes from, like what generates heat in our system. And for now, we'll actually just assume, well, the, the, the GPU built into this, uh, this CPU is actually idling, it's not doing anything, and the cores are actually computing something really hard. So the, the compute cores of the CPU are, are working and generating heat. At the same time, these uh, systems are usually built into a computer in a way that there's a, um, a heat sink on top of them, which transports off all of that heat generated by the chip so, so as to prevent it from, from, from overheating. Um, and 
actually, this sketch might be a little bit misleading. Um, the heat sink, by sort of um, squashing this, what's called a thermal interface material, it's um, sort of a paste around these edges, you could assume that it extracts um, heat sort of uniformly from, from all of the, uh, the surface of the chip, right? So the, the, the heat leaves the chip via its surface. Um, and so if we actually wanted to model where the heat sources are in this chip and sort of where the heat sinks also are, where, 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 the, where the heat leaves that system, we could look at a function like this, right? So we placed three Gaussian blobs on the cores themselves, which are the heat sources. And you can see the unit here is watt per uh, cubic millimeter. So it's essentially heat per, per unit volume. Um, and then there's another uh, negative co uh, constant, where, uh, yeah, negative constant function su uh, superimposed onto these Gaussian blobs, which models the heat sink, everything that is getting pulled out of the CPU. Um, yeah, and now you might wonder, well, we talk about PDEs here, so what is the PDE that actually models this system? Well, I already talked about the heat equation, so here it is. Um, it's a linear uh, PDE. It's also second order. Why is it second order? Anybody? Exactly, yeah. The, the Laplace term contains the second, the non-mixed uh, second partial derivatives. Exactly, yes. So this is where the, that second order comes from. I'm going to talk about a little, uh, uh, what these individual terms actually mean a little bit later. But for now, note that this function u is going to be the temperature distribution in our chip. Um, and we can see here that there's a temporal derivative. So a, a derivative um, of the time variable involved. Um, a reasonable assumption to make things simpler for us here is actually to assume that the temperature distribution stays the same over time, which will eventually happen in a, in a CPU which sort of runs over time and when, when the, the control on the fans of that heat sink actually reach sort of a stationary point. So what we'll do is we'll assume, well, at some point we are actually going to reach a stationary uh, temperature distribution. And you can sort of work that into this model by saying, well, okay, in, if the temperature doesn't change, then this temporal derivative is just zero. It, 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 uh, there is no change in temperature, no, no, at least no temporal change in temperature anymore. Um, in which case, we arrive at the stationary heat equation, which is just you know you obtain from this equation by just setting this entire first term to zero. Um, and since we restricted ourselves here to this one-dimensional um, subset of the CPU, essentially this line, this actually turns into this equation, right? The Laplacian with d equals zero, with just one dimension, it's just a second derivative. Now, what is that? We have actually already seen that in this lecture. This equation, what does it remind you of? It's just an ODE. Because we restrict ourselves to one dimensional problem, uh, to a one dimensional problem here, it's an ODE. Um, which sort of, you might say, well, what, where's the point in talking about PDEs here? Um, it's just uh, so, things are a little more visual for this lecture. Everything that we're going to talk about in the following actually also applies to the multidimensional case. We, we don't have any specializations to the, the 1D case here. All right, now how do we um, inject this mechanistic knowledge uh, we have from this differential equation into our statistical model? Um, a way of thinking about these, these PDEs is actually uh, interpreting as an observation of this unknown function u. And this is done essentially in much the same way we, we work um, um, with in the ODE case. Um, there is an unknown quantity. We, we don't know anything about this function u. But what we can observe is a derived quantity. We can observe its image under the differential operator. And we know that because we want the PDE to hold in our system, this image of the differential operator, think of it as just differentiation for now, just you know, one partial derivative. We know that it has to be a certain value, namely the value of the right-hand side function. And in physics, um, a lot of so this actually has an interpretation. A lot of the most fundamental laws formulated in physics are actually conservation laws. So they describe the conservation of some fundamental quantity like energy, mass, momentum, charge, uh, some, some phys phys uh, physical observable. Um, and it turns out that these are usually actually expressed as PDEs. Um, and 
the heat equation we've just been talking about, notice that I actually moved one term over the, to the other side, is a statement about conservation of energy, particularly heat energy. So this left-hand side term here um, is proportional to the change in temperature, the, the temporal ch uh, change in temperature, and you can actually, so, so it's, it turns out that this is also proportional to um, the, the change in heat energy. If temperature changes, heat energy changes. Note that temperature and heat energy are actually not the same thing, but they're, in this case, proportional to one another with, via these material parameters here. Um, and we said that, well, every change in heat energy has to be explained via either a heat source, so this Q dot V is actually a heat source, so uh, essentially a, a, a known value of heat entering the system at any point, or it has to be explained by heat flowing in to a certain point from the surroundings via heat conduction. And this actually sort of makes sense because the Laplacian uh, computes sort of a curvature estimate of the function. In 1D, it is actually the curvature, it's just the second derivative. And if you have a situation where you have sort of a parabolic bowl, then you would expect, because the surroundings of, of, the, of the center point are harder than, well, the center point itself, that heat flows into that because well, temperatures tend to equilibrate over time. And this is, the statement is, well, every change in, in, in energy is either, either explained by conduction from the surroundings or by a, a heat source being present there. So there's no energy lost or gained other than what we can explain, essentially. Um, and this is a local statement, right? Because there's all these derivatives involved which, which are computed at every point of that, of that domain. Um, yeah, I already stated that uh, normally this, uh, or abstractly speaking, this is just a local mathematical property, so the value of a, the prescri prescribed value of a derivative at a certain point. And we can actually write this equation, uh, which is sort of, in, in, first of all, just a notational thing, but we can write it as the difference of the differential operator minus the right-hand side being equal to zero. And we define this as the function i, or the operator i, which is, in probabilistic numerics also refer to as an information operator. And for the specific case of just you know, the derivative, you've actually already seen these information operators in the ODE lecture. This is exactly what we conditioned on in the, in, in the probabilistic ODE solver. Um, so this is just a more, more general sort of framework. It doesn't just apply to um, differential equations, but you can essentially express any, any piece of information with such an information operator and it, you can see it as a sort of extension of the notion of a data point, right? A PDE is arguably not, not a data point in and of itself, but it still provides you information about the problem that you're trying to solve. So it's a generalized notion of data or actually information. All right, now we actually want to solve this, this differential equation now. And we have an unknown function u. So what do we do if we have an unknown quantity in Bayesian statistics? Well, we just put a prior over it. In this case, surprise, surprise, it's a Gaussian process prior u, and you can actually see that uh, prior over, uh, up here. It's a Matern 7 halves kernel, um, and just a you know, constant mean function. And the observations, which replace the normal point observations in regular vanilla GP inference, is now the, ups, the information operator, right? We, we, we require the differential equation to hold at every point of the domain where we replace the solution candidate by the GP now. Now, well, how, how do we actually do this? First of all, how do we actually apply such a, such an, such a differential operator to a GP? What, what kind of object do we get from that? Uh, in another, another way of phrasing this is how, how, how do we um, take the derivative of a GP? And second of all, how do we actually compute the posterior now? How do we condition of, on this piece of information? And this is where, oh well, <laughs> actually it turns out that both of these objects are GPs again. So we have a uh, sort of a closure property of GPs under linear observations. Um, and we still have a bit of a problem because this is actually an infinite set of observations, right? Because we want the PDE to hold at every point of the domain and the domain is typically like an interval, for example, it's uncountably infinite. 
Um, so computationally, this is gonna be quite a challenge to do. It's basically impossible uh, for the general case unless you know something analytically about the, the problem you're solving. So we relax this um, piece of information by essentially saying, well, we, we don't want it to hold at every point of the domain, but just at a, at a finite set of training points, X in this case. Uh, and these are because of classical methods that, that are similar to this called collocation points. I think Natana also talked about this in the ODE lecture. So it's essentially the same approach we take in the ODE lecture, just um, that we don't use state estimation here, but an actual GP. All right, now it turns out that these objects are very, very similar um, to the forms of, of um, what you get if you, if you condition a finite dimensional uh, Gaussian random variable on a linear observation. So this actually popped up already in the uh, lecture on ITERGP. It's just, uh, yeah, the, the uh, Gaussian inference theorem essentially on RD, so uh, column, column vectors essentially. But now recall that we actually said, well, functions are also vector spaces, right? So we can see a GP as a probability measure or as sort of like a random variable on function spaces. Um, and yeah, we just use some sort of, so some, some GP prior here. And then as before, we choose a linear operator. In this case, it's actually a linear operator that maps the sample paths of that GP um, onto Rn, so a set of n linear observations uh, of that GP. Um, and we introduce some sort of a noise variable here, which is independent of the GP. So this is just independent Gaussian noise, just, uh, just as in the, the finite dimensional case. Now it turns out that the, that the prior predictive, so the, the, the image of the Gaussian process under this linear operator is actually given by a normal distribution where we map, where, where the mean is given by the, the image of the Gaussian process mean function through that different, uh, the, sorry, that linear operator. And the covariance matrix is very similar to the covariance matrix we actually get in the finite dimensional case, just that um, in, instead of, well, we can't really apply like a matrix product here, right? Because uh, this is a linear operator, not a matrix, and this is not a linear operator itself, but also a function. But the analog of this A sigma A transpose thing in function space, essentially, is to apply this linear operator, which remember acts on functions and returns a vector from Rn, apply this first to the first argument of the kernel function, so fix the second argument of the kernel function, then you have a univariate function in X which returns a real value, and this is actually exactly what we can input into that differential operator because, well, that's the space it's defined on. Um, and then afterwards, seeing it as a function of x again, which now maps from, um, because we index into the, into the i here, maps from the, well, the spatial domain x to r again. And this is, again, one of these functions that we can input into the differential operator. So we apply it again now. Uh, you actually see a concrete example with a concrete differential operator that will make everything a little bit more clear in a little bit. Um, and the posterior of this, this event turns out to actually have a similar structure too. Essentially, we just replace matrix vector multiplication of the matrix with applying the linear operator to a function. Um, and we replace this A sigma A transpose object by um, yeah, that, that thing we already saw here, this gram matrix. Um, I left out a lot of theoretical detail here. We're gonna return to this in at least some vagueness in the end of the lecture, but know that there's a lot more involved than just you know, writing down these equations and you need to be really careful when doing this because of all these infinities involved. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about this a little later. There's a question? It basically is, so think about this map from, from, from. Yeah, so this is why it's mapping to Rn instead of, so normally like just differentiation would map function to function, but this is essentially concatenation of the differentiation with several point evaluations, right? So because point evaluations are actually also linear because they're defined that way essentially, you know, because 
uh, summation of functions is defined pointwise. So um, yeah, th so this is, we, we're actually gonna see this on, uh, on the next slide. So uh, an example of this would be just take a derivative and then evaluate it at a point x. Um, now, if we actually wanna compute this object, what does that look like? Anybody have, have an idea? Like for this specific choice of linear operator. You mean this x? No, it's just some x. It's a fixed x. Actually, yeah, I screwed up here. So this is a different x than, than that. So just you know, think x tilde here. Yeah, but it's, it, it's just some fixed x. Say 3. It's 3. OK, so it's not it's some argument for the function. No, no, it's, it's, it's 3. It, think, okay. think of it as 3. the front here. All right. So it's, it's just, you know, you, you, you differentiate the one argument, then you differentiate the other one argument. It's simple, as simple as that. It's just a little bit difficult to exp express in this standard linear operator notation, right? So you first fi uh, sort of fix the second argument to some value, then, well, applying the linear operator to a the kernel, which is now just a function of the first argument, means I differentiate once with respect to the T1 argument and then insert x into that, essentially. And that uh, now I see it as a, as a function of the second argument, and then I differentiate with respect to that. So it's simple as that. For differential operators, uh, differentials, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, and then, well, if, if you have multiple x points here, then you just build a matrix of all pairwise uh, derivatives, essentially, between these, these two points uh, in order to get at this object. It's actually a matrix. Uh, and actually, to, to, so um, if, if we sort of enter this case that you just, just brought up, where we don't actually point evaluate, where we have a proper linear operator between function spaces, um, we also define these, these covariance uh, kernels and the uh, um, well, th this is a kernel. These are cross-covariance functions, um, which are essentially the same thing we de defined above, just that we, we actually see it as a, as a function of the, the point we want to differentiate at uh, afterwards. And what you can show um, by essentially applying what you just learned about, uh, what you just learned on the previous slide, uh, is that if you have such an operator and it fulfills certain conditions, which we're going to talk about later, um, then the, the, the image under that operator of a GP is just a GP again, by definition, essentially. Uh, and this is how you get at the derivative of a GP, for example, right? If, if this is just a derivative um, operator, just for example, uh, for a scalar GP, just differentiate once, um, then you differentiate the mean and you differentiate the kernel functions on both sides, essentially, to get a, a symmetric function again, for example, you can see it like that. Uh, and then that's a GP again, under certain conditions. Now let's apply that to our PDE case. So we return to well the same GP prior and the, the observations, and we already said that uh, we already saw that. Well, applying the differential operator to the GP is a GP again with specifically this form of uh, posterior well uh, moments, um, and you can actually see that GP here. So this is the in this case, the, the, well, the second derivative-ish, or the scaled second derivative, because that's the differential operator we're working with, of that GP. You can see that happening because the samples are actually much less smooth. We lose degrees of differentiability by differentiating these functions, which is also how you know that you're working with a matern kernel and not with something like a squared exponential kernel, because the samples from a squared exponential kernel are actually smooth, so infinitely differentiable. Um, yeah, now, now that we've seen that, um, we can also apply the same theorem or the same table essentially to this problem here where our, the linear operator is now, well, first apply D, then evaluate at the set of points. Uh, and we comp uh, can compute the posterior uh, Gaussian process in this case. Well, we know it's a GP now. 
Um, and if we actually apply this to this problem, then we first define the set of collocation points. The blue dashed lines here are these x points, essentially. Um, and then, well, the observations are given by this black function, because this is essentially the right-hand side space of the PDE, right? Once we applied uh, the differential operator, the GP has to sort of match the, the, the right-hand side function. And this is why the y values of the um, these observations in this transform space are just given by point evaluations of the right-hand side function. And you can see in this space, we ex ex essentially just have a um, no normal Gaussian um, process regression problem, but we actually propagate the, the knowledge we gain from that back to this original GP, which is connected via the differential operator. And well, we can see that it sort of reacted to it, but it doesn't seem to really have worked. There's still a lot of uncertainty left. So what's the problem here? Think about what I said about PDEs not being uniquely solvable. The boundary conditions are missing. It actually does work. It, it, it's, not, it's not broken in a sense. You can actually see that all the individual samples, which you can actually also see from this plot, all samples sort of approximately solve this equation. There's just degrees of freedom which the PDE doesn't fix. And this is actually exactly this linear degree of freedom that I was talking about. So every sample of this GP, at least approximately, is different sort of from, from one another by a linear, added linear function. Sort of, you know, just, uh, yeah, just, just scaled or, or skewed actually by, by the, exactly this term. Um, and well, since this posterior is now just a GP again, and if we, for example, impose Dirichlet boundary conditions, so we prescribe the value of this temperature distribution at, at the boundaries of the interval, the left and right boundary point, um, which we, like physically you can do, could interpret this as, as a measurement from a thermometer, you might sort of attach there. Um, then, well, we just have a normal Gaussian process regression problem because the posterior of that previous problem is a GP which you can just take as a prior for a normal GP regression problem. You just observe two values at the boundary. So there's nothing special about this. And now it works. So we still have a bit of uncertainty left here. Um, actually observe that the right-hand side basically does not change. So it's, it's essentially the same from before. But now uncertainty collapses and the remaining uncertainty you can see here is just the approximation error. We, we didn't actually require the PDE to hold in every point of the domain, just in these collocation points. But um, this is also why we get some, uh, this reflects actually in the GP's confidence estimate. It says, well, I'm not certain because I didn't get all the information essentially. Um, so let's recap a little bit. What did we do? We, we've seen that a generalized form of GP inference can actually produce an approximate solution of this boundary value problem that we formulated here. Um, and we get an estimate of this approximation error that is typically quite difficult to handle. Um, here we're actually returning to this graphical model from the beginning, if you remember correctly. So we have a, the description of a physical system, which we initially don't know, but we condition it on the observation that some mechanistic uh, knowledge, uh, we, we have some mechanistic knowledge about the system here, which is in this case, we measured the values of the, the, the temperature values of the CPU at the boundaries, and we know how heat flows essentially through a piece of silicon. Now, what is unfortunately a little bit unrealistic about this is the boundary values in deployment are usually not known. These thermometers don't exist if you have a, a, a CPU in your system. There are thermometers on a CPU, but not at the boundaries. Um, so we need to sort of get rid of that in order to actually have a, a realistic model. And secondly, these heat sources, the, the values of these heat sources are also not exactly known. The way we modeled this was sort of, well, okay, if the cores actually compute something, then let's approximate the heat source distribution with like a Gaussian blob, but you don't know it is actually a Gaussian blob. Like we haven't measured that. Um, so to get around this, it would be actually kind of cool to have the possibility of adding uncertainty to both the 
the boundary values because these are also not exactly known and um, the exact values of this heat source distribution. Okay, so let's return to the case where we just conditioned on the PDE. What is a more realistic boundary condition for this uh, set? Well, more practical boundary condition at least. And uh, it turns out that I already stated that, that um, we, we, we know that heat is extracted approximately uniformly over the entire surface of the, of the CPU. And actually, um, these boundary points are sort of the, the, the side parts of this, uh, this box, this ideally, idealized box that the, this, um, the CPU is represented by. So physically, you can actually model these boundary conditions. So the, 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 the information about how much heat is extracted from the surface translates to a so-called Neumann boundary condition, which is instead of setting the value of a, of a bo um, boundary point, it sets the first derivative of a boundary point. If there's a lot of heat being extracted, then you can assume that sort of the temperature distribution uh, moves onto the boundary in a, in a relatively s steep declining slope. And if there's a lot of heat entering, then it's a positive slope, at least on the, on the, on the uh, right slope here. So if we actually do that, we, we model the uncertain uh, values of that derivative because, yeah, we don't know exactly. Like, we, we don't know how much exact heat leaves via the, the boundary, but we can sort of add some plus, plus or minus some uncertainty that, to that. So we model it with a, another Gaussian, in this case a Gaussian process, but, well, it's, it is actually just a Gaussian distribution because it's just two values instead of a function. Um, and we add an additional information operator, which is given by exactly that derivative at the boundary. Don't worry about this. This is a directional derivative because normally if you have a multi-dimensional domain, so say for example like a plane, it's not just a derivative, but it's the derivative in the direction of the normal, um, the normal vector to that boundary. So essentially how much heat flows out of a surface through the, through the thing is, well, given in, in, in the direction of that, uh, that normal vector, the exterior normal vector. But think about it as just the first derivative for now. Um, and well, yeah, this is an information operator describing that Neumann boundary condition. It's also not a, in this case, not a normal Gaussian process regression problem anymore because we have another observation through a linear operator here. It's just a different one than the differential operator um, of the PDE. It's this B, this B, this boundary operator we saw before. And if we actually do that, well, oh, sorry, we see that we got rid of one of the degrees of freedom, right? So instead of there being a linear degree of freedom where we can actually have a, uh, an additional slope, uh, we fixed the slope, but the only remaining degree of freedom in the samples of this GP is the offset, the translational degree of freedom. And this kind of makes sense because we just said where, where heat flows to and where it flows from, not at what absolute scale the system operates. So this could be a system running at 1,000 degrees Celsius, or this could be at like the, the minus 200 below zero. So how we actually fix that absolute scale is by these thermometers that are actually contained on the CPU, just not at the boundaries. They're contained in the center of the CPU core. And we, so we have uh, measurements, thermal readings, which from, from these sensors, which are called digital thermal sensors, at three points along this, this cut through the, through the CPU. And we actually add those, this collapses. But it doesn't collapse fully because, well, there's measurement uncertainty on these thermometers. Um, and so we only can do so much, right? Essentially, what we can learn from the absolute scale of these uh, three, of these three measurement, measurements. Now, again, we, we already said that, well, we, we don't actually know the, the heat source term. Um, there should be some uncertainty on it. It was sort of a eyeballing rough estimate of, of what might be going on. So how do we fix this? It's actually maybe, maybe even too trivial. Just add another GP. All GPs, everything. Um, so instead of saying, well, the right-hand side of this PDE is some fixed function, we sell, say, well, okay, it's just some GP. It's a probability measure, an uncertain estimate of a function that we actually should know. So we model our prior belief about what that function actually is and by another GP. And we can use the same inference technique now, but there's a bit of a problem because 
the physics of the problem actually, well, first of all, this, this, this deterministic boundary function we used before was carefully chosen such that it actually integrates to zero. And this makes sense because if, if it wouldn't integrate to zero, then in total there would be more heat entering the system than is leaving it. And in this case, we would never reach thermal equilibrium. It was, the, the system would just keep on heating up because there's always more energy entering the system. So we need to choose this, the, this, this function, this right-hand side function, to integrate to zero. But how do you do that with a GP? A GP, if you just add Gaussian noise to that, that single estimate, then some of these samples will consistently lie above the, the mean, which we use as the original estimate of the right-hand side function. And then, well, they will have a bigger integral. So how, how do we solve this problem? How do we uh, essentially guarantee that this GP has area one in all of its samples? Exactly. Integration is a linear operator. Integrals are linear because, well, the integral of a sum of two functions is the sum of the integrals of the two functions. So we can actually formulate another linear observation, well, linear information operator, which exactly um, formulates this specific condition, which I call a stationarity condition because it refers to st uh, thermal stationarity. Um, you actually have to add in the, the boundary effects too because, well, there's heat leaving via the boundary. So the heat that leaves via the boundary and the heat that leaves sort of on the interior, which is modeled by that, that negative term in the, in the right-hand side function, and then plus all the heat that is generate, generated by the CPU cores, that needs to be zero. That needs to equilibrate essentially. Um, and so by actually adding this additional constraint, which now doesn't actually affect our function u in the first place, it's just the, 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 the right-hand side function and the boundary function, q, v, and q, a. Um, the, well, the prior over these two functions changes, and you can actually see, if you look closely, that samples that start out below the mean here, which the mean actually already did integrate to zero, will actually, in the, sorry, will actually in the end lie consistently above it. And then they, this happens in such a way that this actually, this in integral zero condition holds for all of the sample paths. And well, now we can sort of apply all of these information operators um, to the, to, well, this joint GP prior, this is actually a multi-output GP prior now, to arrive at this system. And this is, I would argue, one, uh, uh, a much more realistic model in terms of the assumptions that it makes about the problem than the one we started out with. And you can see that, well, there's still some uncertainty left, which is, makes sense because we, we don't have a certain right-hand side function, we don't have certain boundary conditions, and we don't have certain measurements. So all of these uncertainties contribute to the posterior uncertainty about the solution. But you can actually see that the, the red area, the red shaded area down here, it's actually, I realize, quite difficult to, to discern that. Um, the red shaded area in here lies essentially consistent, sorry, lies consistently within this blue shaded area. The blue shaded area is the uncertainty about the right-hand side function. So all of, essentially, or most of our um, estimates for the curvature, or well, the, the image of the, the GP under the differential operator agree with our uncertainty, or they're consistent with our uncertainty about the right-hand side. So that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's recap again. So we've seen that this GP approach combined with the notion of an ins um, information operator enables us to integrate prior knowledge about the system's behavior, which is uh, formulated as a GP, well, as the assumptions made by a matern kernel in this case. Um, we can inject mechanistic knowledge in the form of this linear PDE that we've been formulating. We can have uncertain boundary conditions and right-hand sides, which actually appear quite often in practice, specifically also in the context of inverse problems. Um, we can use uh, noisy empirical measurements to get rid of some of the uncertainty that we get from, well, uncertain uh, boundary conditions and uh, right-hand sides and the approximation uncertainty. And all this happens while we provide quantification of the approximation error that we get by you know, not requiring the PDE to hold exactly at every point of the domain. 
um, we get an error propagation from these uncertain estimates of the system parameters, the right hand side, the boundary conditions. Um, and the bigger story behind this is that all of this is only possible because instead of just giving a point estimate of the solution, we actually relax that a little bit and say, well, we, we just answer with a, an infinite set of solution candidates which are weighted by a probability measure. It's essentially just uh, one of the, essentially the promises of Bayesian inference in a, in a different form. But yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Instead of using a point estimate of that function, just use a probability measure over functions which in, can give you confidences, which can give you samples, which all, in this case, exactly fulfill the, the um, conditions you subjected to. Um, yeah. And it's also probably more honest because instead of saying, well, we actually know that this is the right-hand side function we want to solve the PDE with, you acknowledge, well, there is uncertainty in that. There's practically always uncertainty in these estimates. You almost never know these exactly. And this is a way of actually modeling that. Now, I already teased this. You can actually simulate exactly the same model also in 2D. This approach is exactly the same, only that you replace well, your one-dimensional grid of points by a two-dimensional grid of points essentially and change the prior a little bit. Um, you can see that it works. And actually, because there's almost the same, uh, same temperature across the, the, the y-axis here, you could argue that, well, the 1D model was actually quite a good model in the first place because there's not a lot of variation. And, you, and by positing this, this 1D model the way we did was, well, we said it's essentially the same temperature along that dimension. So it was probably fine to model it like that, just, just as a proof of concept here. Now, in, so in contrast to the ODE lecture, um, we didn't really talk about time here. But what is time other than just another spatial dimension, you could argue, space-time uh, domain, essentially. And you can apply I exactly that to a 1D version of um, the heat equation, so now the actual heat equation, not the one where we set the temporal derivative to zero, where now this axis is the time axis. It's just, as I said, another spatial dimension. And this is the, the, the one uh, spatial variable we have. And now you can actually see that this, in a sense, resembled, uh, resembles a lot an, an ODE with an infinite dimensional state space. So you have a, a state you can think about it as a, a state variable per domain, spatial domain point. And then, well, you have an ODE part which describes this evolution over time. And if you slice through, um, through this function over time and actually animate what's happening, then you get a physically plausible simulation of a heat diffusion, which also has all these uncertainties because it's a GP, right? There's not a lot of uncertainty here because I didn't add uncertainty to the right-hand side and the boundary conditions, and I used a relatively dense grid, but in the end, you can sort of see that the grid sparsifies and there's more uncertainty specifically at the edges. So you can simulate uh, temporal problems also with this um, approach by essentially saying, well, time is nothing special. special. Time is just another input dimension, essentially. Um, all right, so I talked a little bit about classical numerical methods for these PDEs, which have been developed over this past uh, century. So how does this approach fit into it? It might seem a little bit weird to use a GP when there's all this stuff already developed. But it actually turns out that the posterior mean of this method we've been developing, assuming that you don't add any uncertainty, so you, you have exact boundary conditions and you have exact right-hand sides of the PDE, is just the point estimate produced by some classical method. In this case, it's called symmetric collocation, which is also why these points are called collocation points. Um, so this is just one um, method. So where's uh, the, the plethora of other methods? More generally, we've actually, we've actually showed that, um, not in this lecture, but you can actually show that um, all so-called weighted residual methods can be, can be realized as these posterior means of a Gaussian process, just without the uncertainty quantification, obviously. And some collocation methods are actually an instance of these, but there's also finite volume methods, which you, which you might, heard, might have heard. Uh, and there's also the large class of what are called Galerkin or petrov galerkin methods, which contain probably the most famous method for solving PDEs, which is uh, the finite element method and also spectral methods, 
Um, and the way you get to these methods is essentially by changing the way you discretize the equation. Remember here, we took this PDE residual, this du minus f, and just evaluated it at a couple of points. Well, why would you just evaluate? You can essentially project onto any other function because you have a Hilbert space, usually. So you have an inner product on functions and you can just put in another function there. And by essentially by, by realizing it this way, you get at all these other different methods by ch carefully choosing the functions that you project on and by carefully choosing the prior you work from. Uh, with a bit different scheme, you can actually also show that finite, uh, finite difference discretization of PDEs can be realized via GP inference. This is another paper from our group. Um, and now you might wonder, well, why would you even use GPs in, in, in this, or additionally to this plethora of other metho methods? Well, we get this uncertainty um, quantification, and what's kind of nice is, because we know that the, the posterior means of these methods are the same as the classical methods, we can essentially use them as drop-in replacements uh, of these classic, classical methods, because you get the same solution, just plus uncertainty quantification. And that's kind of cool, because you can reuse existing software stacks, essentially. All right, quick summary. Um, in general, we've seen that GPs can be used to solve linear PDEs, but maybe even more importantly, we showed that these information operators are quite an elegant language to realize regression, so function estimation, essentially, from very heterogeneous types of information, not just point, point evaluations, but all sorts of linear functionals. Um, and that turned out to be quite helpful in these hybrid or um, yeah, physical, physics-informed or uh, uh, mechanistic models. But in the beginning I said it's like incredibly hard to solve these equations. So where is all that hard math that uh, should be necessary according to that statement to, to actually solve the equations? And I mean, so far, we just really needed derivatives and a little bit of linear algebra to actually express what we're doing here. So where is all that? Well, as I said, there are some very important um, failure cases that we should be aware about. And um, mainly there's two points. So maybe you can come up with uh, one of the points where actually what we just did is not working if, if we formulate our model in the wrong way. There's one very obvious one and one not, not so obvious one. So someone have, an, uh, someone have an idea? Think about what, well, I mean, we use derivatives of GPs, right? So what can go wrong with a derivative? Anybody? Well, a function might not be differentiable. If you differenti differentiate a non-differentiable -diff uh, function, you essentially, it's undefined, right? You, you don't know what's happening. So first of all, we need to make sure that the sample paths of RGPs are actually differentiable. Because otherwise, it's, it's kind of meaningless what we do here. And the second thing is that, well, G GPs and specifically evaluations of GPs are random variables, right? And you might know from your probability theory, statistics class, random variables are functions which need to be measurable in order to actually produce a meaningful uh, sort of or, or, or a consistent statistical model here. Now, if we differentiate a GP, then that derivative, because the GP was random, um, the, we, we, we think of this derivative of the GP, specifically the point evaluated derivative, also as a random variable. It should be a random variable, right? Because, well, the, the quantity that we differentiated is, is random. So that derivative better be measurable. Otherwise, yeah, we're, again, in undefined territory. So everything that we do in this case doesn't work. Fortunately, there's a way of, of uh, choosing your prior and choosing specifically, tu essentially tuning it to that differential operator you're using such that all of this works out, but you need to verify some important conditions. And I'm gonna try to go over the, the formal details of that theorem in a little bit. This is actually uh, from, an, from an upcoming um, 
publication of ours specifically on that topic to, to make everything rigorous in a sense. Um, so first of all, let's talk a bit about the, the, the sample paths of the GP. First of all, what, what even is the sample path of the GP, formally speaking, and when are they differentiable? Um, well, for, first of all, actually, let me say, because I'm not going to come back to that, uh, this, this, the, what, what's, what's called bounded here, or the statement that a linear operator is continuous, in this case, under, under this, the, the assumption that, well, everything else in here holds, sort of gives you the measurability of the derivative. So I'm not actually going to talk about this so much more. Just recall that matrices are always continuous. So the, the, the linear maps defined by a matrix, all linear maps in a finite dimensional vector space, in fact, are always continuous. In infinite dimensions, this doesn't hold anymore. And you need to verify this for every particular um, operator. Well, and we sort of, we sort of uh, require this here, but we're going to talk about this uh, in the last slide maybe a little bit. Um, so first of all, let's think about how are GPs even defined? Well, a GP is just a collection of, of random variables, of real valued random variables. One of, such, of, of, such, of these random variables at every point of the domain of the GP. So essentially, if you, if, if you say, well, I evaluate the GP at a point x1, then that is a random quantity, that is a random variable, that's a real valued random variable. And in this set of random variables that define a GP, there is specifically one corresponding to that output at the GP of the GP at point x1. Uh, don't be confused by this omega. This just comes from the definition of a random variable. A random variable is a function from this um, sample space of the, of the probability space, this omega, to some real value in this case, if you fix x. Um, and think, you can, I guess you can think about this omega as like a random, uh, random number generator, right? It's, uh, uh, if you sample something from a random variable, you first sample an omega from your probability space, which the random, that's what the random number generator does. And then you transform that thing through this, this function f, or f of x in this case, to produce you a value. And well, if, if you cho chose this random number generator and that function f correctly, then you get, for example, a Gaussian random variable. If, if, yeah, you choose that, choose that in the correct way. So for GP, we first of all only know what the distribution of a finite combination of evaluations of a GP is. That's essentially what you do when you sample from a GP, for example. You evaluate the kernel function at all the points you want to sample at. And then, well, this you know from the definition that that is a multivariate normal distribution, and you sample from that. But we use GPs to model functions, not the evaluations of functions. So where do the functions uh, enter in this definition? If we actually fix one such value, so imagine that we actually were to continuously sample a function, continuously sample a, a sample a path from a GP, we would do this in the following way. We would fix an omega. So we would essentially say, well, random number generator, generate like a random event. And then we transform that omega um, essentially via all these functions. So there's, there's, for every x, there's one such function. And if we fix omega, then well, we get, a, we, we get one such function um, by looking essentially at the collective of all of, of, all of these fx's uh, with omega fixed. And this is what's called a sample path. This is what, what we talk about when we say, well, we, 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 we want a sample path of the GP. And this is also why we think of, about GPs as models of unknown function, functions. This is obviously something we cannot do in a computer, right? Because there's an usually uncountably infinite number of these x's. Um, but this is what you were doing. Well, think about it as uh, constructing like an infinite dimensional matrix, then taking the Cholesky of that and then you know, using this to, to compute your, your regular GP um, sample. And if we look at the collective of all of, the, all of such possible sample paths by sort of looking, well, taking one for every possible event generated by the random number generator, then we get what's called the sample path of the GP. And what we need to make sure um, for, for our purposes is that um, all of these sample paths in this sample space are sufficiently differentiable because otherwise we're doing something that is undefined, right? 
Um, second of all, um, if, we, if we state that we want to compute LF, so the application, or well, the, the, the image of some GPF under a linear operator, L, what we actually mean is, first of all, fix an omega, then you have a sample path, a function which just maps x to the real numbers, and then we map that through the linear operator, and then afterwards we sort of let omega go again. So it's the concatenation of essentially a sample path with that, that operator, and in this case, because we choose the operator to map to Rn again, um, this is just a, a, an Rn valued random variable, so a random vector even though there is like an infinite dimensional object in between there, which is this GP, right? Um, and I already said that, well, this is exactly the, random the, the thing that needs to be a random variable. This needs to be measurable because we, we condition the GP on the fact that this has a certain prescribed value, right? Um, so yeah, this better be measurable. Again, not really going into details here. It turns out that these sample paths of GPs are actually reproduced or can be made into a reproducing kernel Hilbert space by choosing an appropriate kernel. Um, I'm not really gonna go over this. This is just for the people that know what an RKHS is. Um, however, usually the problem is, actually uh, I, I believe always the problem is that, that um, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space of the, the actual kernel of the GP, so the kernel function that you choose is not the space from which the samples come. The samples are, uh, informally speaking, usually rougher in terms of differentiability than samples from the, well, elements from the original RKHS. Um, and you sort of need to choose a larger space in which these samples are contained. And you can actually show that um, a sample from a GP um, is almost surely not from that space. So with probab probability zero, you draw a sample from specifically that space. Um, let's look at a concrete example, which is also very useful in practice. So this is actually why I'm um, ending on that, um, is the Matern kernel. So uh, scary expression. You can simplify this quite a bit for specific parameters p here, uh, which, I, which is actually an integer. And it turns out that this parameter p controls the differentiability of the GP. So, um, the higher the p is, the more derivatives you can take of that gp, essentially. Um, first of all, the RKHS generated by that kernel, so the function space that, 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 that is generated by this kernel, um, contains functions that are p times uh, differentiable. So you can actually get, uh, you can, uh, yeah, well, if you, if you get a function from that space, you can differentiate it, differentiate it p times, actually continuously differentiate it p times. Um, but the problem is that if you have a GP with specifically this kernel, then the samples are not p times differentiable. The samples are actually less, have, have, have less continuous derivatives. Um, and you can show that, or informally speaking, you can show that there are actually d times less, uh, d half times less partial derivatives where d is the input dimension of the kernel. So for example, in our case, we chose a matern seven halves um, kernel, um, which in the um, in the in the uh, covariance RKHS, I'll call it the the kernels RKHS, which mean that would mean that the functions are actually three times differentiable, but since we modeled a, a d equal one problem, um, the the functions we draw from that GP actually one times less differentiable, so two times differentiable, which is exactly what we, what we need here. And for, for a rule of thumb, you can, um, if, you, if you need sort of partial derivatives up to order at most m, remember we have a second order equation, so for us m is two, um, then you can, choose, you can use this formula to compute the, the parameter p for the Matern kernel, which you actually need in this case. And a nice thing is, if, if you actually choose this uh, specific um, formula, then you actually know that the differential operator on the paths of that GP is actually bounded, so you get a random variable. That's a nice plus. 
with that. Ah, sorry. Um, and yeah, uh, so, so this is actually, you can generalize this, this process. I actually should have done that here because I talk about dimension. Um, these are normally just Euclidean norms. So instead of just computing an absolute value here, it's the, it's the well, yeah, the Euclidean norm of the difference. Uh, so you can deploy Matern kernels in uh, an arbitrary number of input dimensions, but specifically for PDEs, and you will actually, actually see that on the exercise sheet this week, um, it's better to choose um, to, to, to construct a d-dimensional kernel by taking products of uh, 1D Matern kernels over the dimensions. And um, this is specifically useful if you have sort of mixed uh, orders of def uh, derivatives. Remember in the heat equation, there was only one sort of a first partial derivative with respect to time, but second partial derivatives with respect to the spatial variables. So it actually makes sense to use a, well, a, a, a Matern kernel that gives you two partial derivatives in the spatial part of the kernel, and one that is rougher, maybe is exactly one degree of differentiability rougher for the um, time, time uh, dimension. So that uh, helps you adapt to the concrete um, equation you're trying to solve. Yeah, with that, I come to an end. Um, we've seen that PDEs are this um, important and actually sort of ubiquitous language for, for modeling problems, physical problems specifically, but also other uh, problems from other domains in the real world. Um, we, can, we have seen that we can use our uh, recurring framework of GP inference to actually solve these PDEs, but more generally, GPs provide this, this framework uh, in which we can fuse or combine very heterogeneous information sources uh, into a single regression model by using these affine uh, information operators. And in the end, we've seen that you need to take quite some mathematical care uh, so as not to make mistakes in the model construction, but this mostly applies to the um, construction of the prior, and I've given you sort of a shorthand for how to get at a specific, a prior for a specific equation in practice. All right, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions.